Hey everybody, it's Joe, uh, host of Lines Love by Donkeys podcast. Uh, joining me today will be Travis Haycraft uh, again. He was here before in the Iran Iraq series, uh, and he is the closest thing of a subject matter expert our podcast has on the Middle East and Kurds in general because he lives and works in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, but this podcast is originally recorded as a bonus episode about Kurdish history and something of um, a debunking of what is the the mythos that surrounds the PKK, the Peshmerga, and the YPG, YPJ uh, that has been permeating Western media since the beginning of the Syrian civil war and the ISIS invasion of Iraq. Uh, what it won't be talking about um, is the U.S. withdrawal from Syria and the resignation of Secretary of Defense Mattis because we recorded it before all this happened. Um, so we might talk about that at a later time. Uh, but we record this as a bonus episode and we decided to release it as a regular episode. Uh, so maybe we can um, help alleviate some of the uh, misinformation and outright historical revisionism going on right now uh, in the conflicts in the region. And I hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome to another episode of Lines Led by Donkeys podcast uh, bonus episode. So, you know, thanks for giving me money and getting access to the show. Uh, today with me again is Travis Haycraft, Haycraft coming live from Kurdistan. Uh, hopefully this time we don't lose power. How are you doing over there? <laughs> well, I'm doing pretty well. It's finally starting to get cold again. Well, I guess again. I don't really know if that's the right wording, but it's cold now, um, which is really a blessing because the summers here are brutal. I can imagine. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but... um. No, it's nice. Um, the work's been pretty, pretty busy lately, but um, I've got a weekend off, so here I am, going to talk about Kurdistan, Kurds, um, communism, the opposite of communism. I guess that's fascism. Yeah. And idiots, uh, which I think is a good combination of topics. <laughs> yeah, it was really interesting. I think it was like what two or three days ago. You sent me a you, you slid into my DMs and and just <laughs> went off about how dumb everybody was about Kurdish issues, yeah. and I, I'm a little guilty of that uh, myself. Um, even though I try to follow the Syrian civil war and ISIS in Iraq as much as I can, and you know, I just looked into Kurds for Iran Iraq series. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's it's so there's so many different moving parts that it's it's yeah. almost like paying attention to a significantly more confusing game of thrones episode <laughs> um and it, it's it's made even more complicated by like all, all the different groups that um like the western world likes to latch on to from various points in history uh for whatever reasons normally bad um it, you know it, it reminds me of this thing that happened probably like two or three years ago now um, you probably remember it since you're, you know, there. But uh, that guy uh, named Abu Israel. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, the, no, the, no. the 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 fear of ISIS that everybody was talking about, uh, and, and was yeah. like Fox News had a piece on him, and he was all over Facebook. But like, he was killing American soldiers like six years before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean we have a very short memory, I think, for a lot of things. <laughs> it gets shorter. Uh, the American historical memory gets significantly shorter the darker your skin gets. Oh, I've, no I've no, noticed. Um, yeah, well, it's like, I mean, I think what we talked about in um, the episode I did about the Iran Iraq War when in 1988 the U.S. was supplying Saddam Hussein with like all kinds of financial aid, military aid, and so on. And then like two years later, we're bombing the shit out of everything that we bought for him. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, yeah. And it was only then when we admitted to Iran, like, okay, maybe Iraq was the aggressor in that war. And that was like the most we were willing to to spot them. Yeah. I mean, and even then we still kind of continue to blame them for all the things that uh, Iraq actually did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, so, I mean, I think, I guess the, the reason for my frustration is, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the inciting factor was just a couple of days ago, like, um, you know, every once in a while while going through, well, I got one of the, the staples of life in the, in the Kurdistan region. And I expect Iraq as a whole, um, is checkpoints. 
Um, understandably, I mean, obviously the security situation here is uh, is pretty bad, and I, I'll probably talk about that a little bit more later on. But and so the you know the way to solve this, or potentially the way to solve this, as a lot of people think, is to set up checkpoints all over the place with uh, military um, or police or whoever. And in Kurdistan, the uh, or the Kurdistan region of Iraq, the military is the Peshmerga, which is a kind of semi-official um, militia force. And so they've got these uh, checkpoints all over the place, and most of the time they just kind of wave you through. But every once in a while they'll ask for your papers, and maybe they'll take you out and you know pat you down and stuff like that. Most of the time it's fine, but every once in a while they can be a bit a little bit mean, and so that that ended up happening to me. And so I got home but that, later that day and I was like, oh my god, like if I see another freaking article from some idiot at like the national review talking about how the Kurds are like our saving grace in the Middle <laughs> East. Like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to flip my shit and I'm going to send a very angry email to the editor or instead I could, you know, DM Joe on Twitter and be like, let's do a bonus episode where I say politically dangerous things. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, a pretty good point. Um, from, <laughs> from our standpoint, uh, you know, you hear a lot about how like um, the Kurdistan region is like the saving grace of of Iraq, and I heard it as far back as 2005 for the first time when I was a kid. When I first enlisted, was like Iraq's a shithole. You know, excuse my language. Iraq <laughs> isn't a shithole. They've yeah. they've been through some stuff, and um, <laughs> but you know, Kurdistan's great. It's like a little America. They they love us. They they love democracy. They have the best military in the in the region. Like all these things, so like I, I I admit that I believed it for a really long time, mm -hmm. and uh, because you know why would anybody lie to you uh, about these sort of things? Uh, and that turns out that's not such the case, huh? Well, not exactly. I mean, obviously it's very complicated, and there's you know there's we can't explain all of it in an hour long episode. And I'm definitely gonna make a couple of sweeping generalizations that some people might get mad about. And uh, for that, you know, I apologize, but I guess I'll, I'll try and give a little bit of an overview of um, of kind of what the the reality of the situation is here, um, as best I can. And um, and I guess in order to do that, I kind of got to go a little bit into the history. And I don't want to do too much repetitive. So most people who are listening to this have probably heard the series on the Iran Iraq War, so they'll probably understand that, um, you know, the Kurds they're an ethnic minority. They occupy in Iraq, northern Iraq, like the northern quarter or so of the country right now i believe there's I know, i'm gonna make up a number i think it's like five or six million in iraq but that could be totally wrong it's like 15 or 20 percent of the total population um but also there there's a kurdish minority in iran in turkey and in syria and depending on who you ask the combined total of all kurds is probably between like 15 and 40 million um obviously there, there's no good Sorry, uh, they're they're the largest um, like diaspora without their own like nation, correct? Yeah, that's the, kind of the 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 a phrase you'll hear a lot, like the largest ethnic group without a nation. I'm not a hundred percent true sure if it's true, but oh, if, I have no if, idea. if it's not true, they're definitely like top, you know, number one, number two. Because um, I know like the Amazigh people in northern Africa who are also called uh, Berber, which is a derogatory term, by the way, like. The Berbers of Northern Africa um, are also like a large stateless nation. Um, but the Kurds are definitely number one or number two. Um, but yeah, and they're pretty, they're oppressed in pretty much all of the countries that they, uh, that they occupy, Turkey, Iran, Syria, Iraq. Um, all of those governments have spent a lot of the last like 50 to 60 years um, repressing their Kurdish minorities in often very brutal ways. I mean, obviously... In Iraq, there's the Al Anfal campaign of ethnic cleansing and genocide, the, you know, the Halabja chemical weapons attack in March of 1988, and a series of other just really, really awful things that happened to the Kurds of Iraq. And I absolutely, for some of the things that I might be saying about the Kurdistan regional government and the Peshmerga, I absolutely do not want to like dismiss or denigrate the uh, really awful history of Kurds, particularly in Iraq. And I also don't want to denigrate like or dismiss the uh, the sacrifices of like Kurdish fr freedom fighters who fought against Saddam Hussein. Oh, not at all. And that's like <laughs> that, that's not exactly or we're not talking. We're not going to be shit talking like the PKK or the YPG for fighting ISIS and and Assad. Yeah. Like those are all things we can generally agree are good. Um, yeah, yeah. 
But they've definitely but. like they've <laughs> definitely uh, engendered something considered a pretty thick mythos around them. Oh, one hundred percent. So yeah, I mean, there's the Iran Iraq War, there's the Al Anfal genocide campaign, and then there's the first Persian Gulf War, in which after which um, the uh, I believe it was the president of France. Uh, I don't remember his name. I think was it, was it Chirac at the time, or is that is no, that too late? I think Chirac was. Bef- I honestly, I don't know. I don't know very much about French. Or France. Um, I should. I'm a European history major, <laughs> but here I am dropping the ball. <laughs> uh, oh, I was Middle Eastern studies, so I can't really. Yes, uh, do this much is about Europe. this is squarely on my shoulders. I, I am a hack <laughs> and a fraud. <laughs> oh no! Well, it doesn't really matter. He was some French guy. His name was probably Baguette or something like that. For sure. And uh, but he um, in the UN he negotiated a no-fly zone over northern Iraq. Um, in like 1992 or 93, something like that. And uh, this meant that Saddam's military could no longer go in and do genocide stuff. Um, a lot of aid was delivered to the Kurdistan region and it received essentially de facto autonomy at this point. There is then a civil war between the major factions in the Kurdistan region. And here's where we're going to get to something that's going to be kind of prevalent throughout the episode and that's going to be three letter acronyms oh yeah um, so just get ready for it because the his the political history of kurds is like a history of three letter acronyms uh, so just to cover our ass <laughs> so, the president of france in 1993 was francois Mitterrand. Mitterrand, okay <laughs> for all of our uh the people who gave a shit out there <laughs> go all on six of them yeah yeah uh, the angry guys in berets and striped shirts being like yeah. ha, ha, ha. <laughs> how yeah. dare they <laughs> yeah um but yeah so the two major fact factions in the the kurdistan civil war were the um the kurdistan democratic party or kdp um led by the barzani family and the the other faction was the patriotic union of kurdistan or puk led by the talibani family and i say the barzani family and the talibani family um and i mean that literally these are both um, less political parties and more um, familial parties. Not like every member is a part of the family, but like they're led by families. The leadership of the party is passed down. Oh, so it's like dynastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, and ostensibly, like the two parties have separate political ideas. Like the PUK is much more of a, um, like a supposedly socialist or leftist Um uh, political party, while the the KDP is more of a kind of traditional nationalist conservative um, party, but really there there's not a whole lot of difference between the two. Uh, they're both, um, you know, highly nepotistic, and the the power structure is based on how close you are to the the family man at the top versus really merit or ideological fervor or anything like that. Well, at so least they, they fought, have that in common with the rest of Iraq. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. Um, but yeah, so they fought the civil war basically amongst themselves. There are a couple other factions, like there was a, an Islamist faction and some others, but basically it's the KDP versus the PUK. And after a couple of years, I think two or three years, there was a ceasefire signed. Um, and they, the result of the ceasefire was like a power sharing agreement between the two parties. They basically split the government. They split the government in half. Split the uh, the Kurdistan region in half. In which case, the KDP would control the like the northwestern half, and the PUK would control the southeastern half. Um, and they'd also split like government ministries and stuff like that. Um, and then in 2003, the U.S. invaded, um, and um, this like the Kurdistan autonomous region became like very much a, uh, not only a de facto autonomous region, but like a de jure autonomous region. It was included in the new Iraqi constitution, as was this power sharing agreement and a bunch of other more complex stuff that I don't really want to get bogged down in. But suffice it to say, the uh, the power sharing agreement between the PUK and the KDP continues to this day. However, um, over time, the faction that has definitely gained much more power and influence is the KDP faction under the leadership of um, Masoud Barzani, who is the head of that uh, faction. And his his father, Mustafa Barzani, was fighting against 
you know, Saddam way back in the 60s and 70s. And then Masoud Barzani has continued the uh, the family line, although he isn't fighting against Saddam anymore. He's mostly fighting against, uh, I don't know, diabetes or something. Um, <laughs> the true enemy. He's a bit of a chonker, if you know what I mean. <laughs> he, it's not his fault he's thick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, basically... What he does is he goes around, he wears his his red turban and he smiles benevolently and like blesses new malls that are opening or new, uh, well, not torture facilities. I mean, very open, um, liberal and democratic prisons with absolutely no human rights violations whatsoever. Absolutely none. Doesn't happen. Uh, No, it doesn't. If if we hear a large crashing noise (laughs) followed by screams in Kurdish... Uh, that would be the Asayish kicking down my door. Yeah, that was, <laughs> the Asayish is like the um, internal security forces uh, of the Kurdistan region. Um, there's also Parastin, which is more the uh, the secret police, the ones that people don't want to talk about. And then there's also Agence, which is like, well, I couldn't find any information about them. So they're probably like the really secret people. Um, so they have a, a pretty, pretty thick uh, state security apparatus like okay. from that Saddam would probably smile about it sounds like oh, honestly Saddam would be jealous I think of the state security services here in Kurdistan not because they're like necessarily you know equally brutal but I think they're far more effective largely due to the um, close relationship between the Kurdistan regional government and the United States after the uh, overthrow of Saddam Hussein in 2003 um, which was and wow <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, our third get, our you, third co-host, the CIA, shows up once again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if, if there's a loud crash on your end of things and people start shouting, "Get on the ground! Get on the ground!" Yeah, yeah, well, Travis swatted me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's what I'm here for. Yeah, but, um, but yeah. So basically, the uh, the Kurdistan government after 2003 became because of their friendly relationship with the U.S. They helped the U.S. overthrow Saddam. Uh, Peshmerga forces joined up with uh, U.S. Special Operations to uh, invade from the north um, in 2003. And there's been a pretty tight relationship between the U.S. military, the U.S. intelligence apparatus, and the Kurdistan regional government ever since. And that has also resulted in the Kurdistan regional government being very invested in the the, kind of what you talked about earlier, in this perception of the Kurdistan region as um, the kind of the good Iraq, the good part of Iraq. The part where you can come and invest your money, basically. And what that led to is after 2003, all the foreign companies who came in for, uh, be it oil production or humanitarian aid development or um, other, you know, import export kind of stuff. Uh, they all came to the Kurdistan region to be based here in Erbil. And uh, here we are 15 years later, and that's kind of why I'm here, too. Uh, Because this is where the jobs are in Iraq. If you're an American, uh, Brit, Canadian, Australian, whatever, and you want to come work in Iraq, odds are you're going to start out in the Kurdistan region because they've very much made business here friendly for foreigners. Um, And so I think that's a lot of what's led to this perception of the the Kurdistan region as this, uh, you know, the real Iraq or the good Iraq, I guess you could say. So it's and not the, so much a perception of Kurdistan as a whole. It's just like Kurdistan has the free market. So they're cool. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, def- like, <laughs> yeah. Like the Kurdistan region has definitely, um, they, they stayed very secure. There's not a whole lot of the, the instability that plagued the rest of Iraq after 2003, because, you know, the Kurdistan region had already been largely, Kind of taking care of itself since the the, the mid 90s and so the the kind of the sectarian civil war that kicked off after the invasion and the overthrow of saddam didn't really affect the kurdistan region very much and also um the need of the kurdistan government to um, maintain that level of foreign investment meant that their level of security is much much higher um and like the the control over the country is much higher um, because they have a very real material um, need to maintain that security and ensure that no Americans get kidnapped and beheaded on TV. Yeah, it's bad for um, business. It's bad for business. Yeah. 
I mean, obviously, I don't think they really care very much about us as people. They care about us as big dollar signs. Um, and, you know, I don't necessarily fault them for that. Right. Because that any other government's any better. And but, we have but, a pretty solid history of fucking them over, like, all the yeah. time. Uh, yeah. Even before we promised them liberation during the Gulf War, we kind of bankrolled their genocide. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the... Um, the U S has a pretty, pretty bad relationship with the Kurds, but also like, it's kind of interesting because, you know, we, we, I think we talked about a little bit earlier about how Americans have a very short memory. Um, in many ways, I think the Kurds of Iraq do too, because they don't remember that. Um, they remember the genocide. They remember Al Anfal, but I have yet to see any memory of the American involvement in that. And, uh, do you think that has to do with, I mean, they, they can very rightly point to Saddam um, for yeah. that. So uh, uh, maybe that has to do with it? Yeah, and also, I mean, rightly or wrongly, right, or sorry, rightly or wrongly um, a lot of Kurds see the U.S. as liberators um, from Saddam because of 2003. Um, and, um, you know, I'm very much opposed to the Iraq war, but I understand why they feel that way. because oh, I, I can too. Yeah, I mean, after all, I mean, Saddam, it's really hard to to overstate how bad he was to Iraq as a whole and especially the Kurds. Um, and so the fact that after 2003, they no longer had to worry about him directly because of the U.S. I mean, a lot of people have very positive feelings about the U.S. in the Kurdistan region. In the meantime, once um, obviously the provi- the provisional authority uh gave power over to the Iraqi government. What, what was the Iraqi government's policy uh, during that time towards Kurdistan? Was it like completely hands off or did or was the U S kind of telling them, yeah, keep your hands off. They're still functioning. Yeah. So um, the, uh, so officially in the, the, the new Iraqi constitution after the overthrow of Saddam, the Kurdistan region was in court, like included as an, an autonomous region that could maintain like a certain amount of its own security services, um, econ- ec- economic um, like planning, as well as maintain some of its own like visa and immigration controls, um, while also receiving 17% of the overall oil revenue um, made by the state of Iraq. Um, basically, the, what that meant with it, so basically the U.S. forced the the new Iraqi government to sign a constitution that's extremely favorable to the Kurdistan region because in terms of economic output and population seven, like the Kurdistan region is not 17% of Iraq and yet they're receiving 17% of the oil wealth. Right. Um, and they have some kind of like ancestral claim to Kirkuk as well. Correct. Yeah. That's a very complicated political argument because everyone there's no such thing as an unbiased source. And so, for example, right. the Kurds say Kirkuk is a Kurdish city. The Arabs say Kirkuk is a Arab city. And the Turkmen say that Kirkuk is a Turkmen city. And I personally lean more towards it's a, a combination of all three because that's the real truth. It's none of there. Like, I mean, I just uh, ethnic um, history in Iraq is really interesting. And um but the problem is like, so Saddam kicked out all the Kurds from uh, Kirkuk and also all the Turkmen too. Just don't, you know, don't tell the Kurds that. Um, <laughs> and then when ISIS came in in 2014, Iraq came in, or sorry, the Kurdistan region came in, the Peshmerga came in and occupied Kirkuk. And then they kicked out the Arabs and the Turkmen. Um, and then you didn't hear about the, that part. <laughs> no. And then the, the Iraqi army came back in um, in October of 2017 and uh, reoccupied it. And as far as I can tell, I haven't seen any credible claims of like removing Kurds or like re Arabizing it or anything. But like that doesn't stop the, uh, the Twitter press from making wild claims about like the, you know, Saddam 2.0 kicking out all the Kurds. But the truth is, Kirkuk doesn't really belong to anybody other than maybe the broader nation of Iraq or state of Iraq. And so, I mean, we could, we could go on a long rant about my opinions about, you know, ethnic nationalism as a ideology. 
um, and sure. the benef- benefits of like balkanization, but that's kind of neither here nor there. But the basic idea is... As an Eastern European, I support that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, <clears throat> let's not even start talking about Azerbaijan versus Armenia, because I have some very strong opinions on that. Uh, nothing bad ever <laughs> happened there, other than the uh, Azeri war crimes. But <laughs> no, oh, trust me, the, it's, the, it's fucking terrible. you the Armenian war crimes? Yeah. I'm sorry. I think I said on the episode uh, I, I did with Nate that uh, there ain't no racism like Eastern European racism. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's very, oh, very yeah. fitting. Yeah, well, I was in Azerbaijan a couple of months ago, and, uh, well, they haven't gotten over the Khojali massacre, let's just say that. Uh, um, my family still talks about a genocide from over 100 years ago, so I understand completely. <laughs> it's hard to get over that kind of stuff. Yeah, and so, yeah. for example, so, you know, in Iraq's kind of no different. Everyone is still like, well, we should get this because you did that, and so on. Um, and they're, none of them are like invalid because everyone did probably commit some kind of horrific crime against everyone else. Oh, yeah. Um, but but yeah. And so basically, so the, the 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 constitution signed by the new Iraqi government after the fall of Saddam was very favorable towards the Kurdistan region, which led to a lot of economic development, a lot of foreign investment and a lot and, you know, generally more stability among the, the Kurdistan government. Um And uh, so then we fast forward to 2014, summer of 2014, and the the rise of ISIS. Um, So ISIS, not to go into too much detail, but they swept across western Iraq. They captured Mosul. They were within like 10 or 20 kilometers of Erbil here in Kurdistan. They were within water range of Baghdad airport, um, all within the space of like, you know, one or two months. And it was really crazy. Yeah, I remember uh, watching, almost watching that in real time. Um, it's definitely that whole uh, the the ISIS invasion of Iraq is definitely going to be a mainline episode eventually um, because it's just so interesting to me. And but yeah, yeah it's fascinating and uh, just really really strange and all the, the various things that happened. Like ISIS briefly had an air force. Yeah. Um, ISIS they, with M1 Abrams, things like that. Yeah. At the, oh my God, they're doing fucking burnouts and <laughs> BMP ones in the street. <laughs> yeah it was, a, it, was, it was insane um and there was a huge amount of panic um that at that point like in places like Erbil, because all of the um the you know the thousands of american european and other expats who were in Erbil, obvious were obviously were looking for any way they could possibly get out of the city and out of kurdistan before isis came in and started you know beheading people in the yeah uh, i mean look what square. they did to camp spiker Oh God! Honestly, the, the fact that, that that particular war crime is not talked about more is a, a travesty. I mean, that's just—it's truly awful. I mean, I, I understand that. You know, I'm 30, so I lived through um, like the Balkans genocide. I lived through um, the All Iron Fall genocide, but like that was in the early 90s. I don't remember those. Mm-hmm. Um, the, easily, the the Camp Spiker massacre is one of the worst things that ever happened in my in, in my memory. Yeah, I mean, it was 1,700 people killed in the space of a day. Uh, like video. Systematically executed video. Yeah. Oh, I, rem- I saw a couple of clips of it, and it's, I mean, it's just depressing thinking about it. Um, I'll, be advi- yes. I'll be asking you uh, many questions when I go to cover that. <laughs> so prepare uh, yourself. No, yeah, hit me up. I've, I've, got, some, I've got some interesting uh, tidbits, I guess. Um, but yeah, so they, they, you know, they were very close to Erbil. All the expats were fleeing. Um, people were panicking. And it was at that point when the U S military stepped in and Obama started authorizing airstrikes against, uh, ISIS in Iraq and I believe Syria at the same time. Yeah, I think, Um, I think it was, this is also, uh, yeah, this is also when the battle of Kobani was going on. And this is around Um, the same time the Yazidis were trapped in uh, tel Afar, correct? Oh, yeah. And oh, about that. So um, one thing, you know, they with a capital T don't want to tell you about the Yazidi genocide um, is that a large part of the reason it happened is because of the well, here's where the door is going to start getting kicked down. Is the cowardice, <laughs> the cowardice and the more um, the failure of the Kurdistan regional government to provide protection. And not only that, but the. So basically what happened, so the uh, the region in which most of the Yazidis lived is is a region known as the Nineveh Plains. Um, ISIS was coming across this area, 
which was ostensibly at the time under the, the protection of the Peshmerga forces. The Peshmerga, what they did in response to this was they disarmed all of these Yazidi villages, um, basically took all the guns from the people's houses and then left. Didn't take any of the occupants of these villages with them. Jesus um, Christ. So when ISIS came into town, obviously the Yazidis and everyone else in the village um, was left completely unable to defend themselves. And so they either fled or died or, you know, unfortunately, many of them were taken and in, taken into like sex slavery. Um, and what was the reasoning for that? I know um, I know very little about the Yazidis and the Yazidi religion, but I understand um, that generally speaking, almost everybody in the region thinks of them as apostates. And is it like, is that kind of why the Kurds had no intention of protecting them and they just stole their shit and bounced? Yeah. I mean, I think that's probably part of the reason. Um, I haven't, I haven't looked, I mean, part of the problem is that there's not a whole lot of good sources on this kind of stuff. Cause a, it was very recent and B like it's extremely political and, and so still nobody, ongoing. For the most part, yeah, I mean, there's still Yazidis in slavery in Syria. Yeah. No, exactly. Um, but basically part of that was probably, you know, that the religious aspect was, I'm sure, involved. But also, I think just the fact that the, the Kurdistan government is very much a nationalist government. And you'll see a lot of issues with um, just across the board with disenfranchisement of non-Kurdish populations and non-Muslim populations. So you it's just Christian good old fashioned Kurds. racism. I mean, yeah, pretty much. Um, there's a lot of reasons, but the bottom line is basic prejudice by the government against non-Kurdish um, populations. Um, That's awful. Yeah, so it, you know, it's really awful. So, I mean, the, the Yazidis fled. A lot of them went up onto Mount Sinjar, where they were saved basically by the PKK. Um, the PKK was the only organization that uh, stepped up to actually fight to, to the death and stand their ground and help hold out. And they succeeded. Um, and then the U.S. Air Force came in and started launching airstrikes. Um, and that kind of paused the uh, the ISIS advance in that area. And similarly, the Peshmerga finally grew a pair around 15 kilometers outside of Erbil and turned around and started shooting back. And also, more importantly, the U.S. dropped you know tens of thousands of tons of ordnance. That, that um, probably helped a little. Yeah. Uh, there are also instances where the Peshmerga would be standing across... Like they'd withdraw to like the official area of Kurdistan. Um, like, for example, there'd be a river dividing the hook governorate, governor, which is under the Kurdistan region from the Nineveh government, governor, which is under the Iraqi control. They'd stand across the river and ISIS would be on the other side and they'd be like, you don't come over here. We're not going to bother you. Um, so there was definitely. So a they appeased a, ISIS. Yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I, I know I'm uh, laughing, but that's so cartoonishly awful that it's yeah, kind of really mind blowing because I understand they're they're different uh, like they're there's have they have their own sovereignty from Iraq to an extent, but they're still Iraqis. Yeah, exactly. Um, they're still Iraqis. And more importantly, they're still humans. And I think anyone could it, at that point. We are. We definitely knew how bad ISIS was. I mean, there was no hiding it. it in day. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that was their brand. Exactly. Brutality was their brand and um, everyone knew it. And uh, so the Peshmerga knew, the Kurdistan government knew, everyone knew about how bad they were. Um, and uh, and that's and when, uh, that, it, sorry, it, it's it's interesting that the PKK came in and saved the Yazidi. And I know there's mm -hmm. uh, there's no end of differences between the two, but uh, the Kurdistan Workers Party is the, is the PKK and those are... Um, now, I understand that that is the major group that the Turkish government has issues with. Yes. Um, but they all and I also remember the Turks bombing Iraq to get to the PKK. Yeah, uh, they did that a couple of days ago, I think. Yeah. So they're still doing that. OK. <laughs> yeah, they, they're occupying part of the Iraq at the moment. Yeah. Um, and so the PKK are are um, they're communists, correct? Or are they just left? Uh, they started out Marxist Leninist. Um, kind of in the vein of all the other Marxist, Leninist or Maoist uh, rebel groups in like the late seventies. Right. And then they eventually morphed into what they are now, which they call democratic confederalism, which is kind of a, a vein of kind of general anarchism. Um, so, but the, yeah, they are explicitly socialist or leftist, however you want to describe them. 
Um, so they don't have they, the same nationalist qualms that the the more supposedly more powerful and organized Kurdistan government had, and they right. came in and saved the Yazidis. Yeah. So like yeah, like the PKK may be a Kurdish Kurdish nationalist movement, but ideologically they are also genuinely a, a socialist movement, which includes a kind of like an, a more international focus um, than just a general like a uh, nationalist group like the the Kurdistan government. And so yeah, they came in and helped save a lot of Yazidis from genocide. And you don't hear that. I mean, you hear Kurds save them. You don't hear the PKK save them because the PKK <laughs> yeah. is a terrorist organization by the U.S. government, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it is that's indeed. what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So technically, any aid to the PKK is material aid to a terrorist group, which is why it's interesting when the U.S. provided lots of air support to the PKK and Sinjar. So technically, the U.S. government is in violation of, um, you know, t- terrorist aiding clauses. Um, not that I think anything is uh, ever going to come of that, of course. Uh, because, that's kind of the thing that we do. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of, kind of the job of the U.S. government is to support terrorist organizations. Yeah, I mean, normally they're not on our own list of terrorists, though. <laughs> like, they, they are later, like when they turn against us, but not, yeah, not normally well, during the act. <clears throat> get me on for an episode about the Syrian civil war and U.S. support of uh, Syrian rebel groups, and we'll... We'll revisit that topic. <laughs> I, I am more than willing to do that. Uh, so the so the actual Kurdistan regional government appeased ISIS. Yeah. And but you know, was it ISIS knew that they weren't be able to take uh, Kurdistan because of U.S. air support or like or did they just we'll save you guys for later? Well, I mean um, something saved them. Yeah. Well, I think uh, so. Basically, you know, ISIS for all its faults still acted in kind of a, a rational manner. Um, you know, they may have been crazy murderers, but they they weren't idiots. And so they knew that um, they, they knew how to pick their battles. And I guess they continue to know how to pick their battles because they're not done yet. Right. Um, and they knew that um, at that point, the weakest link in the chain was the, the Baghdad government. Because, um, I mean, the the Baghdad government has always been just horribly corrupt and incompetent since 2003. And the Kurdistan government, for all its faults, was never nearly as on the yeah. same level of in, corruption. And in comparison, they look pretty competent. Yeah. They, <laughs> um, and that's saying a lot because the Kurdistan government is, uh, once you get to know it a little bit better, you start to realize that it's an incredibly perfect and has no flaws whatsoever. That's right. Uh, um, remember, tap on your mic if there's a gun to your head. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but um but yeah so isis and and at this point knew that the, the baghdad government was the weakest link and so they focused and also um just an incredible and abs- so one of the main goals of isis you know on top of occupying you know the whole world and turning it into an islamic state was explicitly the eradication of shia um and since the baghdad government is um, was at the time ruled by um, Maliki, who was very much a kind of a Shia, pro-Shia kind of guy. Um, and the southern Iraq is, you know, just chock full of juicy Shia that they wanted to kill. Um, that's where they're really focusing their effort on is because, I mean, the, the Spiker massacre uh, where they killed 1,700 Iraqi Air Force cadets in the space of a day, all of them were Shia. Um, they separated out the Sunnis and let them leave, right? Yeah, exactly. They let the Sunnis leave and they killed the Shia. Um, and this was a pattern that repeated itself throughout this whole time. They'd go into a village. They'd be like, all right, you know, pray and we'll see who prays in the Shia way or something like that. And we'll just kill all of them. Um, they like even Christians, they often wouldn't kill them. They'd just be like, OK, either pay the jizya tax um, or we'll kill you with the Shia. They just killed them. Um, and. uh so that's why, like, when they were within, you know, mortar range of Baghdad, that's when things were starting to look really scary. Because my, my opinion, my personal opinion, is if that if ISIS had been able to make it into Baghdad, um, or even beyond, especially beyond Baghdad, we would have seen a genocide um, on the scale of, like, the Rwandan genocide or worse um, if they'd have been able to get there. Because that was the real goal was to just kill as many Shia as possible. Um, oh, yeah. And I think without you, I mean, I'm uh, I think I've said this a couple of times for a military historian. I'm shockingly anti-war. But uh, 
uh, yeah. you know, without U.S. support, that was probably an inevitability. Yeah, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure if I agree, but definitely U.S. support helped um, stop them outside of Baghdad, because basically once they got within spitting distance of Baghdad, the the Shia of southern Iraq um, basically came together and were like, all right, we're not going to let this happen. The government, the military the armies failed. Um, and so they formed an organization which they called the Hashtashabi or the um, like uh, in English, they call it the Popular Mobilization Units, which right. is basically Shia militias. Um, in the U.S. press, you'll see a lot of people calling them like Iranian backed Shia militias. Sure. And like for all that people criticizing, you know, oh, we don't want Iran in Iraq or whatever. Well, it's like, you know, the Iranians came in and they helped organize some of these militias, which were then the first people in the front line stopping isis from entering baghdad and committing genocide so like we can fault iran for a lot of things but nonetheless for better or worse well for better their support helped stop a genocide in iraq and those Um, those same groups ended up butting heads with the kurds correct yeah so fast forward a couple years iraq has eventually or managed to get its shit together with the regular army uniting with the popular mobilization and they push back across Ambar province. They retake, you know, Fallujah, Ramadi, Tikrit, Baiji, Hawija, and so on. Eventually they gear up for the Mosul battle, which is going to be the big one because Mosul is the second largest city in Iraq. Um, millions of people live there and it was ISIS's capital. So they start up the, the, the Mosul offensive. All the camera crews go to the Peshmerga who are kind of like on the Northern half of Mosul um, or, their goal is to capture kind of the northern area above Mosul and the Iraqi army is going to come in and take the city itself. And so all the camera crews, of course, go into the, where the Peshmerga are and are built. They'll interview all these Peshmerga about like, yeah, like us, we're the Peshmerga. We're going to go kick the shit out of ISIS and Mosul. Like, yeah, it's going to be amazing. Like go Peshmerga, BG Kurdistan, et cetera. And then the Iraqi army goes in and does 99% of the fighting, yeah. loses thousands of soldiers and probably the most or the largest urban battle since like Stalingrad. It has to um, be. The battle was massive. It was it was huge. I mean, the casualty estimates from just civilians are like twenty to thirty thousand, like on the low the low end. Um, thousands and thousands of Iraqi soldiers were killed. Yeah, thousands, I still don't know how many. I don't think I haven't seen any solid numbers on it. Yeah, they're probably still finding them. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't believe any of the numbers that you see because everyone has a good reason to lie. But oh, um, yeah. at a minimum, tens of thousands of people total died in that battle. It was lasted eight months. It destroyed pretty much the whole city. It was just really, really awful. And the Peshmerga did basically none of that. They secured Bashika, and that was about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is like a little village west or east of Mosul. Like, that's about all they did. Um but nonetheless, I think there are still a couple articles that came out around the time in, you know, rags like the National Review or things called like Patriot Daily or like American Freedom Magazine and shit like <laughs> The Daily Wire, the Daily Caller or whatever. <laughs> exactly. And like they they can't say, hey, that army that we've been making fun of all this time teamed up with Iranian backed militias and took this city. Like, no, 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 it was the Kurds. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to give the good press to organizations like Kataib Hezbollah, which are responsible <laughs> for killing like a crap load of American soldiers in 2006, 2007. Right. Um, like the, the Shia militias, which are some of the most effective fighting forces against ISIS, were coincidentally also some of the most effective fighting forces against American occupation forces. Right. Um, and that's when like, that like, Abu Israel guy popped exactly. up. Abu Israel, the angel of death. Yeah. Um, he he yes. said he personally killed at least like eight American soldiers, I think, in one interview. And he Let's still fucking hates him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, these Shia militias have very good reason to be anti-American. I mean, I don't think, I don't remember if you covered it during the Iran-Iraq War series. I don't think so. But after the first Persian Gulf War, basically the U.S. said, hey, Shia, if you rise up against Saddam Hussein, we'll totally support you. Oh, yes. And so they, yeah. And so they rose up and the U.S. was like, psych, never mind. Yep. War's over. Um, Gotta go. Yeah. And then Saddam Hussein proceeded to kill over 150,000 people, um, drain the marshes of southern Iraq, basically destroying the livelihood of all of the people who live there right. and proceeded a, a, like a, on a 10 year long reign of terror against the Shia of Iraq. Um, so basically the U S betrayed them and led to the deaths of several hundred thousand people. 
um, several hundred thousand Shia. So there's a very good reason for that distrust. And of course, then the U.S. invaded and occupied it again in 2003 and caused the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people yet again. Right. <laughs> but um, I digress. Back to the Kurdistan issue. Um, the U.S. has since invested probably tens of billions of dollars in military like investment in the Kurdistan region. Right now, there's one large base at the Erbil airport, and they're building another one a couple of miles east of Erbil, probably so that they're within, uh, you know, spitting distance of the Iranian border, which I think is kind of funny because by building it, the closer they build it to Iran, the more easy it is for Iran to just immediately hit it with ballistic missiles right. in the event of a war. So, like, I really, you know, I, I pity whoever, whatever poor, like, you know, logistics unit gets stationed there. Um, it's like being stationed on the border with Korea. You're the first one going to yeah. die. Yeah, you're a tripwire, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also now that I've spent a little bit of time in those mountains, um, the U.S. is not going to invade Iran through those mountains. That would be a disaster. We would lose so hard. Um, <laughs> those mountains are gnarly. It's really hard to understand. I guess. Was that I the Z Zagros Mountains? Or is that a different mountain yeah. range? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's all kind of the same or some branch of, of the Zagros. Um, they, they're intense mountains. Like Those are gnarly. I've been in a couple of other mountain ranges around the world, and these are probably the the toughest that I've seen. They're not the tallest, but they're they're intense. I mean, you know that they were they were bad because even Saddam Hussein's like, yep, not invading over those. That's yeah, a, that's a that's, limit. Yeah, that's why I went to Khuzestan, which is like not mountainous. Yeah. <laughs> And he still failed. Um, so, you know, learn a lesson, America. Of course, we won't, we won't, learn, we yeah. won't learn the lesson. Yeah, historically, we're great at learning lessons from, from other points, <laughs> which is why we never invaded <laughs> Afghanistan. Uh, of course not. Well, I've uh, spent 17 years doing the same thing again and again and failing every time. Yeah, that's just ridiculous. We would never do that. Uh, so when the uh, popular mobilization groups and uh, mm -hmm. the Kurds uh, butted into one another, that happened mm -hmm. in uh, Kirkuk, correct? Yes. Yeah. So basically, what happened is in October of 2000 or September, sorry, of 2017, Masoud Barzani, who was losing control and influence because of being extremely unpopular and putting off presidential elections for like 20 years, um, basically saying, "Oh, we'll have them next year. I promise." And then he was actually given an excuse when ISIS invaded. Exactly. So he suspended all that crap and. So eventually ISIS was kind of on its way out and he knew that he had to kind of re regain his popular momentum. And so he kind of dangled the carrot in front of the Kurds who have wanted independence and sovereignty forever, you know, very understandably and said, OK, we're going to hold a referendum on I think it was September 25th, 2017. And surprisingly, he actually held it. I thought he was going to cancel it. Um, but he yeah, actually, I, I thought, thought for sure he was going to cancel that because the whole time that government was the, in Baghdad is like, we're going to fuck you up. <laughs> Basically, yeah, the Baghdad government was like, you know, try it, bitch, try it. <laughs> and uh, and everything yeah, like Obama was this. Ob no, that would have been Trump. Trump was well, not Trump, but whatever his underlings were said, don't do that, please. Erdogan said, don't do that. Iran said, don't do that. Everyone was like, no, seriously, don't do that. That's stupid. Uh, but he did it the absolute madman <laughs> and uh, so they the the referendum happened there's pr almost certainly a lot of you know voter fraud suppression faking stuff like that not but nonetheless the, not in the democratic freedom republic of kurdistan <laughs> exactly um but not, nonetheless i'm sure like no matter how unfair the election may have been i think the yes would have won anyway um simply because like Kurds want independence, understandably. They may not believe that it's going to happen, but they want it. And not like I was talking to a guy who said, I think he ultimately didn't vote because he knew it wasn't going to work out. But he said that, like, I didn't vote because I couldn't vote no. I can't, as a Kurd, vote no for independence. Right. Um, which I totally understand. But so, yes, would have won anyway. Um, so it did win. And the Iraqi government was like, oh, OK, now I see how it is. And so they immediately invaded um, Kirkuk occupied it without firing a shot um, and pushed basically all the way back to the original borders drawn under the 2003 constitution. They closed the airports in Kurdistan for a while, not allowing domestic flights. 
they cut off all, you know, economic aid or whatever and basically crippled the country. The Kurdistan region was unable to pay its salaries to government employees in Peshmerga. There were riots, protests, and so on. Um, and eventually the Kurdistan government was like, okay, they backed down, they discarded the results of the referendum, and they lost a lot of uh, the kind of the de facto autonomy that they had gained from the um, with the ISIS war. Um, and uh, so that was just a huge disaster for the Kurdistan government politically. They lost a lot of popularity. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, Barzani resigned, but now he went from being the president to the leader of the Kurdistan regional government. What's so, the difference? Uh, <laughs> Did they just change the title? Yeah, I don't really know. Um, <laughs> but basically nothing changed because uh, there's he's not he's never going to really step down. Um, well, it's pretty clear he doesn't have to. Everybody seems to be, I mean, nobody really demanded it. Well, I mean, a lot of people do want him to go, but nobody can say it. Um, because there were a lot of protests over the summer due to the salary issue. A lot of protesters got shot, beat up, tortured, stuff like that. Um, and so, I mean, like, there is technically democracy here. Um, and by, the, by that, I mean, it's the freest country in the entire world. Um, of course, and they should have independence now because it would be extremely successful under the perfect benevolent leadership of uh, uh, dear leader Barzani, <laughs> supreme leader. Yeah, uh, but like for our intelligent listeners out there, you can listen between the lines um, and kind of get where I'm going with this. Uh, I genuinely can. I probably shouldn't say too much more about that. Um, but. I mean, so, so changing the subject so you don't get your fingernails ripped out. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons why I wanted to um, to do this episode is one, uh, I thought it'd be interesting because how often do we get to talk to somebody actually in Kurdistan? Um, other than you know the last episode, uh, <laughs> yeah. and you know uh, because the mythos that the, the Western uh, world has, and one of those was um, you know the the kind of trope that came around well we're not fighting isis so i'm gonna go volunteer and fight isis oh yeah and okay followed by just all these fucking facebook tough guys would actually pay like and the 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 kurdistan militias or the kurdish militia militias weren't paying for anybody's trip uh they're, they're mm -hmm. like yeah sure if you come over here we'll fucking let you we'll throw you out there that's fine um yeah. but nobody seem to grasp the reality of, of, of the various different Kurd groups. Cause from my understanding, yeah. the Peshmerga did not accept foreign fighters. Um, they, there were a couple of, I think like Kurdish diaspora fighters okay. and like, and others who worked for units, like maybe not officially Peshmerga, but like affiliated with, but broadly no. And so the, the vast majority of, um, of the, of the foreign fighters, I guess is a fair, assessment to call them would funnel into the PKK and the, the, the YPG or the YPJ, yes. um, yes. which are all very, very communist or at the very least left wing militias yeah. from, uh, now the, the PKK is mostly Turkish and, uh, Iraqi, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the, so the, y and, and the YPG sorry. and YPJ are, are Syrian. Yeah. Um, well, sort of it's, I mean, if you ask a Turk, they'll just say the YPG is just the PKK renaming itself in Syria. Well, they all work together um, for the most part, yeah, don't they? There's an element of truth to that. I mean, they're the same parent organization, but uh, the YPG is, a, is officially a Syrian organization fighting against ISIS in Syria. And, um, and we're definitely not shit talking uh, these guys because, you know, politics aside, even though myself, I am a leftist, um, I'm not a militant leftist. Uh, but politics aside, they are one, or at least were one of the most effective fighting forces against yeah. ISIS, and they still control um, like the Syrian Democratic Forces for the most part, don't they? Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's kind of an interesting, and complicated factor. But yeah, broadly, the the YPG is the biggest um, like armed group of the 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 Syrian Democratic Forces, which is the U.S. supported like faction in northeastern Syria. Um, and yeah, the the YPG is like the PKK; they have the same political ideology of democratic confederalism. So basically anarchism, like militant anarchism. Um, and they're, they're pretty cool in a lot of ways. 
Um, but yeah, they don't they don't hide their political not even views. remotely. Um, not even a little. <laughs> we looked beforehand um, just to see. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe these guys weren't as badly informed. We we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Literally, the third line. In the PKK's <laughs> Wikipedia article, says they are a left-wing militant organization. Yeah. Um, and yeah. if you believe the U.S. government, they are a left-wing terrorist organization. Yeah. <laughs> now, the way YPJ and YPG haven't been officially uh, declared terrorist groups, no. but they're you know the the connection is irrefutable. Yeah. But I mean, they're basically they're the same organization in Syria with a different name and different leadership. Right. But everything else is basically the same. And. Yeah. Barring a few things, um, they were incredibly open to anybody who would come and fight for them because they were, yes. you know, they, they were in the fight for their lives. If they lost, yes. there was no going back to the drawing board. There's a fucking genocide in their future. <laughs> yeah. um, and there's really actually, nice. yeah, and there's a Facebook group called the Lions of Rojava, which would actively facilitate your travel into the region in case you were wondering. I don't know if they still operate, but um uh-huh. Probably not. But yeah, yeah, no. So how that that, that would work, basically, you'd get in touch with them via an encrypted email um, and you would then travel to probably, well, depending on what time it was, um, probably you'd go to uh, Erbil or Suleimania in the Kurdistan region where you'd meet up with a contact and then they would smuggle you into Syria uh, where you'd be trained and then spend, uh, it'd be like three months training, much of it ideological, by the way. Um, and, uh, then a couple of months like guarding checkpoints and stuff like that. One, then once they figured they could trust you, they'd send you into, uh, like frontline, um, combat positions. And but so I imagine that was pretty un, um, uh, not what a lot of people were looking for. <laughs> Ideolo- we'll, we'll get into the ideal, ideological stuff. Cause that's my personal favorite of this whole thing. Just how <laughs> funny it is. But, uh, yeah, I imagine for a lot of people, like, cause the foreign fires will like want to drop in for a couple of weeks and bounce back out. Like, <laughs> so like they probably, uh, were pretty unhappy. They found themselves on a fucking checkpoint watch for yeah, months, and- months at a time. Well, there was definitely during kind of the, the height of it when it became clear that the YPG probably wasn't going to get it, going to get exterminated, but they're also doing a lot of like, you know, legit fighting. I think a lot of people went to Syria to join the YPG for kind of a kind of a war tourism kind of thing. Right. Um, it's kind also of legit. gross, but yeah. yeah it is. I mean, there are, there are genuine ideologues as well and people oh, who yeah. really were committed to fight, but there are also a lot of people who were, who were going to kind of, you know, fire a couple of rounds, get shot at, and then take the pictures, take the video, and then go back to right. Australia or New York or, yeah. you know, Berlin or whatever. And they could be like, yeah, I fought, I fought against ISIS. I'm a fucking badass. Yeah. Our, our producer uh, for our show uh, interviewed, um, was it Piss Pig Granddad or Piss Pants? Oh, yeah, Grand- <laughs> Brace Bindel. And uh, yeah, he was there because he was a, uh, a communist and wanted to fight with yeah. but, uh, like-minded individuals. It was kind of like a uh, Middle Eastern version of the Spanish Civil War, except <laughs> that it's still going on. Yeah, that par- I've seen that parallel a lot, and I think it's fairly valid in a lot of ways. Yeah, but, and uh, it's still yeah, no. mostly valid because this seems like the fascists are going to win. But <laughs> no, I think so. Well, yeah, uh, which which a... brings us to our our ideologues who had no idea what they're getting themselves into. Uh, yeah, so I I've got an article. <laughs> um, I've got an article about uh, titled uh, Christian foreign fighters deserting Kurdish YPG in Syria because they're, quote, damn reds. <laughs> um, Which is and, funny uh, because there's multiple Christian militias fighting for Assad, but yeah. <laughs> they picked a fight with the Kurds. Oh, man. No, it's well, I mean, uh, no foreigners have gone to fight for the Assad. Except, OK, there's several Sorry. Armenians who Two, traveled yes, from fucking L.A. Yeah. <laughs> they were fucking <laughs> L.A. gang video? members. Yes. <laughs> they're from a, a, an, an ask is homie. <laughs> <laughs> they're uh, members of an Armenian street gang called Armenian Pride. <laughs> <laughs> one of them died and one of them's now in Armenia. I know that. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not sure who uh, which one was which, but I when I saw that, I was like. Fuck, I hope I'm not related to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would suck. You're never going to get a security clearance. Oh, no, I'm fucked. They had to get checked at the airport one too many times. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, nah, but yeah, so I, I mean, the reason they went to go and join the YPG was because it was visible and they were, okay, uh, another big reason is because the YPG has the YPJ, which is the all-female subsection. 
Right, and that's um, another thing and, that people like to bandy about about the Kurds is like, look, they're equal in a, in a region that's unequal. How exactly. true is that? Well, it's kind of it's a it's an interesting question because a lot of the reason organizations like the YPG and the PKK are very leftist and very pro, for example, um, women's empowerment and kind of a form of feminism, right, is because the culture from which they come from is very very conservative. I don't mean Middle Eastern or Islamic culture. I mean, specifically Kurdish culture um, in these regions is probably the most conservative within the broader Middle Eastern region. Like, for example, in Turkey, um, the Kurdish regions have the highest levels of um, things like female genital mutilation, honor killings, um, things like that. Which explains why the PKK was the natural leftist offshoot of that, I suppose. Exactly. So like a revolutionary organization is always going to have like very opposing ideology to the kind of the base society because it's revolutionary. It's kind of, you know, inherent to the to the game. And so the PKK very much like their number one or one of their number ten, number one tenants is uh, female equality or women's equality and like their form of kind of um, communist feminism. So um, the, the Peshmerga or the Peshmerga, they don't have uh Segre- or they don't have inclusive combat units. No, the Peshmerga is still very much a kind of conservative, traditional um, militia unit because um, they're not, you know, Marxists or anything. While well, the PKK very much and the YPG very much are Marxist and right. pro women's empowerment, and so they have dedicated female units, and those women fight on the front line just as much as men. They're carrying PKMs and RPGs and actually using them and not just posing for pictures. I can imagine they fight a little bit harder than men knowing what happens if they get captured. Yeah, I imagine Their death is true. not going to be a good one. There was also this myth going around um, that ISIS fighters didn't want to get killed by female soldiers because they thought that they would like go to hell or something. That's not true. They don't care. I mean, How, you can't tell. Yeah. That whole I, uh, that whole premise is fucking absurd. Like I yeah. I you think I saw the faces of people who are trying to shoot me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I couldn't I've tell if they had a fucking freedom. side pony. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and that that's why I was really interested in this because personally before going in today, mm-hmm. um I knew that there's obviously difference between the Kurdish groups, but I assumed that the the Peshmerga also dipped into the female uh I guess a uh, manpower pool is in the the person power uh, pool to to staff mm-hmm. their military from desperation, but it wasn't the no, Peshmerga they, at all. No, yeah, well, the Peshmerga never really did a whole lot of serious fighting. I mean, that's another big secret is they didn't do a whole lot of serious fighting at all during the war against ISIS. They basically retreated to their lines, built an enormous sand berm, and sat behind it, um, and then called in American airstrikes every once in a while. You know, there would be fighting, of course, but by and large, it was mostly defensive, small skirmishes, and stuff like that. And the real bulk of the fighting in Iraq was done by the Iraqi military and the popular mobilization. Um, so the Peshmerga never really had any manpower shortages. They didn't take a whole lot of losses across the board. Uh, so they never really needed to enact any sort of radical war mobilization while organizations like the P- the YPG very much, had, you know, women had to fight out of necessity. Also children. There's a lot of accusations against the YPG for using child soldiers. And the accusations are probably true. Um, but I, seems I don't know how much I blame them. Like, yeah, exactly. Like if you're a 14 year old kid in Kobani, um, during the summer of 2014, like, are you going to be like, no, I'm not going to pick up this AK 47 and shoot back because technically I'm a year under the internationally accepted definition of child soldier. Right. Um, of and, course not. The kid's going to pick up the gun. I yeah. mean, Kobani was surrounded. They were, there's no way out. And yeah. if you either you're either going to die fighting or be executed by ISIS or the ISIS is going to pressure, press your child into service like yeah. there's not there's no good way. There's no good explanation. I mean, obviously, we're not supporting the usage of child soldiers, <laughs> no. but I mean, when, when the only other option is dying, I, yeah. I, I, I don't I don't like it but i i get it like there's a lot of things in history that you just have to understand (laughs) i mean war is i mean i've never been in it thank god and i hope i never will be but um i know enough to know that like when the bullets start flying i feel like people probably stop caring about stuff like that especially in a situation as serious as uh, like the battle for kobani or uh similar yeah the bullets don't have age discrimination um So 
they had so uh, going back to that article because this is getting depressing. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so a, a Christian militia organization from the United States. How many people was it? Does it say? Uh, unfortunately, no, it doesn't. This article is fairly uh, general, um, but it does have a couple of uh, interesting tidbits. Um, so, for example, um, uh, let's see. Let me find the the. Set. So one U.S. Army veteran, referred to as Scott, claimed that he decided not to join the YPG after finding out they were a bunch of damn reds. <laughs> um, and this has led to an exodus of U.S. and other Western volunteers from the YPG due to their one due to their left wing stance. <laughs> uh, another, <laughs> another British volunteer named Alan Duncan also said that he had left the YPG who are based in blah, 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 because of their leftist views and said he knew a number of other people who are planning to leave soon for the same reason. <laughs> now, did they go home or did they just join a different group? Well, the very next sentence of this article says many have instead chosen to join Dweck Nausha, a Christian militia in northern Iraq whose ideology chimes more with Western Christian volunteers than the intensely secular YPG. And see, this is interesting because um, I've now visited some of these uh, places in northern Iraq and the Nineveh, Nineveh province and Dahok province, which are very Christian areas, um, kind of Assyrian Christians, I think. Um, and the difference are those Kelde- between- uh, That's the Chaldean church, isn't it? Or is that a different <sighs> church? I, is Chaldean Catholic? I think, I no, I, I'm not sure. I'm not a religious scholar. Now I'm just showing my ass. I'm not yeah, sure. I don't, I don't know enough about the specifics, but it, it might be. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's Iraqi Christians or Arab Christians in northern Iraq, northern Syria. And there's a huge difference between, you know, an American evangelical and a Chaldean Christian or a, uh, you know, a Syrian. Um, yeah. I mean, evangelicals and, are by and large an American creation that, that is very different from the rest of the world. Yeah, very much so. And so I can't really imagine what that interaction would have been like, because like <laughs> there's still Arabs, you know, <laughs> like, so these, these guys can't be not racist. Like I cannot believe that these like American evangelical Christians go to, you know, kill the muzzies or whatever. You know, I hate right. saying that. Um, and then I mean, they that's, that's what they want to do. And they exactly. were probably pretty, and it was probably pretty upsetting to them. They found out like they showed up and the Kurds were not only Muslims, but also leftists. <laughs> like it's like the worst nightmare, unless one of them was also black. <laughs> I don't think there are very many black Kurds, but there are black Iraqis and black Iranians, which is a very interesting uh, cultural history thing that is not really relevant. But but yeah, so they should the uh, the Christians of northern Iraq are a very unique um, group of, uh, you know, various communities and so on. They're very fast, very interesting, incredibly different, very different, completely opposite of your average American evangelical. Um, and also, like, these Christian militias weren't doing a whole lot of fighting. Um, they are more just, like, you know, self-defense for their villages and stuff like that. Sure. And, like, so, it's just so yeah. funny to me that they could, they literally couldn't even plug that shit into Google. I know. Like, if you're going to go all the way to Iraq or Syria, like, Jesus Christ, like, spend five minutes on Google. Like, you'll find it out. You'll Google, like, YPG. You'll click the Wikipedia article. You'll read... To sentence number three and you'll say it'll say like leftist organization and then you'll be like hmm maybe i should keep reading before i spend thousands of dollars on plane tickets and combat boots and ak-47s and all yeah, that kind of shit because they, they don't <laughs> supply anything like no, no you need to buy stuff we're we're, exactly. we're horribly poor yeah i mean you buy your own <laughs> equipment um, because how are they gonna like if they give you a rifle it's gonna be one that they picked up off a dead isis guy yeah um, well at least it'll probably be an m4 then <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, oh man, I've seen so many good AKs here. I love AKs, but oh. yeah, that's the only rifle I own is an AK seventy four. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's that's sweet. I haven't seen one of those yet, mostly because. Um, well, I just feel like the 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 seventy four hasn't really made it to the Middle East 
because of, you know who's going to buy a separate factory to produce the different kind of cartridges. Right. And uh, that's one of the reasons why, uh, like the Soviets put it out during the Soviet Afghan war and uh, mm-hmm. totally off topic, but it, yeah, they put it out during the Soviet Afghan war and then nobody ended up liking it. But <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it's one of the coolest. I'm a huge fan of the AK 74. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've seen type 56s like East German AK MSs, uh, bunch of like bulgarian ones never a russian one just just all the uh eastern european and chinese but uh i think my personal favorite weapon that, that surfaced over there was somebody found a whole bunch of stg 44s oh, yeah. in a box uh for the people aren't, aren't gun nerds because i'm not a super huge gun nerd or anything but mm-hmm. the stg 44 was the i was like the sturmgewehr 44 from world war ii is the first functional assault rifle ever made well <laughs> i will i'll holds you up there and say it probably wasn't the first assault rifle I've ever made, but that's just me being a nerd. I literally pushed up my glasses before I said that. Actually. Um, yeah. Like exactly. I said, I'm not a gun nerd. Uh, I, I understand <laughs> guns in the extent that of what I used when I was in the army and what crops up during history class. Yeah. Well, I, I've, I've was a long period where I was a huge gun nerd and now I'm basically like, I, I don't think it really matters when it comes to, you know, a military because like as long as a thing that, you know, you pull the trigger and a bullet flies out the end, like damn, it doesn't really matter that much for your average yeah. infantry. Man. And we talked about during our, our uh, episode on Iraqi weapon procurement that sometimes the best weapon isn't the best weapon for you. Exactly. Uh, um, so, Travis, uh, in closing, uh, one thing that because <laughs> uh, we're already at, at over an hour here. Um, oh, shit, yeah. yeah, which is, is fine with me. But uh uh, so you are kind of in a precarious position here talking about what you're talking about. And I thank you for that. Um, no what problem. do you see as a realistic future uh, for Kurdistan as it stands? Like is independence really an option or is that pretty mm-hmm. much dead? I would say, I don't really think it's an option, not in the next 10 to 20 years. I don't think, I mean, obviously if something huge changes, you know, you can't predict that, but, Assuming things continue along more or less the same path that they have been continuing on, Iraqi Kurdistan in particular, and obviously greater Kurdistan as a whole, I don't think is ever really going to be independent, um, specifically with Iraqi Kurdistan, because nobody wants them to be. Yeah. Um, they don't really have any economic, like, you know, they don't have an economy um, outside of the nation of, or state of Iraq. Um, a little bit of oil and like a little bit of like agriculture and stuff, but really not very much at all. The Kurdistan government invested all of its money in like construction projects and oil that they then lost when they lost Kirkuk and not like factories and um, infrastructure and things like that. So there's not really, they have to import everything from Turkey or Iran or Europe or something like that. So things aren't, aren't looking too good. No, it's not looking too good. Um, there's also the, the fact that the the recent there's a recent parliamentary election a couple of weeks ago, um, and there's always the chance of the the PUK the KDP deciding to try and one up the PUK and the PUK getting angry and there being another civil war. Um, oh wow! Probably not. Probably not like a serious like you know shooting war with tanks in the streets and stuff like that, but like enough violence to throw out a lot of the foreign investment. Yeah. Um, and a lot of foreign uh, people like me who are working here spending hard-earned U.S. dollars at Kurdish stores and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I mean, I just I don't think there's a whole ton of future. The government's <clears throat> well, I've I've discussed the government and its quality, um, but uh, and then of course for Greater Kurdistan as a whole, I mean, all the various Kurdish factions hate each other just as much as they hate their oppressive governments. Like the PKK and the Kurdistan government hate each other and they fight each other. The Kurdistan government hates the YPG and fights the YPG. Then there's also the Iranian Kurdish groups like the KDPI, which fights against the Kurdistan government, sort of, but it's sort of allied with the PKK, but not really. And um, and they all hate each other. And of course, you know, the Turkish government's never going to let their part of southeastern Turkey be pro- part of Kurdistan. Iran's no, never going to give away the Kurdistan part of Iran. And Syria's never going to let the, the Kurdish part of Syria be independent. And so you've got this kind of like semi-autonomous region in northern Iraq with no economy um, as your only kind of sort of success story. With no allies yeah. other than ones of convenience. Exactly. No allies. And then you run into the other problem of there being like 
two main Kurdish dialects, and they're they only being sort of mutually intelligible. Um, even within Iraqi Kurdistan, there's Sarani and Badini, and in terms of dialects, and it's a very stark split, and like they don't interact as much, and it's like there's not really there's this idea that there are the Kurds. And there are a lot of Kurds who think that there are the Kurds. And this is my opinion as a white guy. Um, but there's no such thing as like a broader united Kurd or like Kurdish polity or entity um, or nation, whatever, what have you. Not yet, at least. Um, and in order So it's all just the, like propaganda for the most part. A lot of it is. I mean, this is a hot take with a capital H and a capital T. Um, and I will welcome criticism because, you know, who am I really to say these kinds of things? But um, I think for Kurdistan as a whole, and I think specific, especially Iraqi Kurdistan, to gain the level of independence, be it literal national sovereignty or something else, there needs to be much more of a broader cultural reckoning around what the idea of Kurdishness is and like a broad level. Because right now it's this very petty, low level, like, you know, the two family pop parties fighting against each other and suppressing, you know, Yazidis, Assyrians, Arabs, uh, Kekai and other minority groups in the Kurdistan region. Um, because it's all just these petty power, po you know, like Game of Thrones, but like even dumber. Um, and with, <laughs> and with BM 21 rocket launchers instead of swords. Um, so it's, I, don't I know, like, like Winterfell's chances if they had machine guns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true uh, uh travis thank you again for coming on and giving us uh an hour and a half long primer on recent kurdish <laughs> history and it still was not nearly enough um no we, i'm sure we could have talked for hours longer but yeah i need to go to bed and the yeah. episode can't be too long but uh no it was great to great to come on and i hope i won't get my fingernails pulled out because of a podcast yeah yeah my patreon dollars can't pay your ransom so <laughs> <laughs> uh thanks well, again I'm, man you I, i'd love to have you, you on any time uh do you want to have anything you want to plug or um i mean i don't really have anything beyond my my very small twitter following so i guess if you want um more of this kind of stuff but in 240 characters you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Haycraft underscore Travis. Um, where I mostly post about cats and T-55s. But That's the only two I'll things that make the world go around. Honestly, what else do you need? It's the only two things that if you drop the land on their feet. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll, I'll leave you alone because I know it's really late over there. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll talk to you again and stay safe. Don't get kidnapped. I'll do my best. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Hi, this is Nate Bethay, and I'm the producer of the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. This show is brought to you by Audible, and as it just so happens, Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash donkeys and browse the selection of audio programs. Download a title for free and start listening. Once again, that's www.audibletrial.com forward slash donkeys to get started.